Adam, Eve, man, woman, paradise, naked, serpent, temptation, deception, sin, death. The thing that's most important about this story doesn't make the list. Love, Adam and Eve. Let's take a fresh look at this as a love story. God creates the world and the man and the woman out of love. The man, the woman, and God. I got this idea from a, a book I came across. It's called The First Love Story, Adam, Eve, and Us. He opens up this topic with um, a scene visiting the Sistine Chapel with his eight-year-old twin girls. Now, uh, the girls apparently weren't too excited about the Vatican museums, too many um, big paintings and tapestries and, okay. But they get into the Sistine Chapel and Bruce says to them, look up. And they see God, like he's suspended in the sky, his finger pointing toward a still lifeless atom. One of the girls says, why is there only a man? Who am I in that picture? But her sister points out something that's very little noticed. Who is the woman under God's arm? Is that Eve? Wow. What she saw, that image, connects the two creation stories two creation stories. I think that's little noticed, but if you um, carefully read the first chapter of Genesis, you'll see two stories. And the two accounts maybe make some sense on a human level. Um, I know my parents, when we asked them once how they met, they had rather different um, tellings of the story. So these two accounts in Genesis, it's interesting to look at the first as Eve's account and the second maybe as Adam's. Okay, I, I don't know if a scripture scholar would um, agree with that, uh, but let's, let's take a look at that, that way. In the first creation story, the days of creation, there's a powerful rhythmic telling to the story. Light is separated from darkness, the dry land from the water. Plants appear and all kinds of living things. And after each day of creation, God said, it is good. The culmination of creation in this telling of the story, man and woman are created together in the image and likeness of God. And only then, then does the account go on to add male and female, God created them. Think about that as two steps. First off, the people are human, and then male and female. The second story we hear today might be from Adam. There's a scene just before Eve is created where you can imagine Adam and God walking in the garden. Adam is lonely. Things are not complete. Something, something is missing, even after God relates Adam to all the rest of creation and all the animals. So God sets about creating a suitable partner for the man. 
Here, the man is created first, but the culmination of creation, the woman. That strange detail about the rib, I, I read in some commentary that in ancient language where this was first told, the word for rib sounds rather like the word for life. And note that the woman is created as the man is cast into a deep sleep, peace, away from danger. And when Adam awakes and sees her, he breaks into poetry. This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Wow. For 3,000 years, this story of Adam and Eve has been in the background of conversations about man and woman. Sometimes it's used or misused as a source of division, oppression. And the second creation story, well, the man is first, obviously. Ah, who is guiltier? Eve, who believes the serpent. Ah, they don't notice that Adam later blames his partner when God confronts them. But consider the second story in light of the first. God creates people in his image. First with no identifiable gender or personality. Then male and female. And he gave them the seed-bearing plants for food and the animals to be with them. And he tells them to have lots of children. There's beauty, wonder, and harmony in both accounts. Don't miss that. Adam, Eve, and us. If you're in a relationship with another person, in some ways you are in a relationship with Adam and Eve and God. It's there in the cultural and religious background that has formed our understanding of love, life, spiritual life, sex life, the roles of men and women. And we've come to recognize that the story has often been abused and misinterpreted by a patriarchal society. And any abuse of scripture robs it of its power, robs it of its beauty. In the past century, with changes in society and changes in the role of women in the world, it's important to take a fresh look at the creation stories. Adam and Eve come into the world fully grown. They weren't created as babies. They're fully grown in this story. Their time in the garden, maybe that's their honeymoon. Ah, paradise. Mm. They're unaware of any concept of nakedness. Sex is part of the gift of creation. And shame only enters after the first sin because of their disobedience. And then they hide from God. And then they cover themselves. And then God makes them garments out of animal skins. As the first two people in the world, they have no instruction booklet about how to be a couple. When Adam and Eve are put out of paradise, they're left to find refuge in each other. And the drama of their story is perhaps the drama of every loving couple. Can they find a way to continue loving? They must struggle to work by the sweat of the brow, their brow when Adam and Eve are put out of the garden. 
They have to work for their food and live among animals who, outside the garden, are no longer really friends to the man and the woman. And later, they experience the deep, deep pain of knowing that one of their children dies by the hand of his brother. There's enduring questions of human life here. How to overcome fears and sins that separate us. How to achieve union, connect deeply, love deeply. In the gospel we hear today, Jesus is asked about the grounds for divorce. Divorce, tragedy, a collapse of the will or ability to love, collapse of the ability to forgive and understand. There's a loss of faithfulness, and there's such deep pain there. When I was fresh out of seminary 40 years ago, uh, to my surprise, I ended up to, uh, as chaplain to a large divorced Catholic support group in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I learned how to be their chaplain from them and listen to their stories. I was awed by their support for one another. They so often felt judged by God and by their church. But there was a deep faith there, a deep desire to remain connected to God and their church community. Things were quite different for divorced Catholics 40 years ago. But when I was a boy, I wasn't aware of anyone around us who was divorced. Just wasn't done. But the people who were felt put out. Then, in the 1970s, as divorced Catholic ministries started, the people got confidence. They refused to hide. They wouldn't go away. They would be visible and present in their parishes. And all of this brought changes, some changes even in church law, and certainly changes in attitude and pastoral care. Back to that question in the gospel. Jesus' response to the question, what are the grounds for divorce? Well, Jesus doesn't get into the middle of that controversy. He takes a step back, as he always does. He cites the men's hardness of heart. There's sin, alienation, lack of forgiveness, and maybe lust in their desire to divorce. And then Jesus reframes the whole thing and refers to that creation account. From the beginning, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man leaves his mother and father and clings to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Adam, Eve, creation. Please remember the wonder of creation, the blessings, the image and likeness of God. The Adam and Eve story, one God, two people, a relationship built on love. And then reflect on your story. What is your story of love?